So yes, the question is, what am I going to do with all of these different texts? And how are we going to pull them together? I want to con contextualize our time together just by referring briefly to last week. Last week we talked a little bit about uh, building a relationship in such a way that when really devastating things come into our lives, when really hard times come into our lives, when deep questions cross our minds, uh, we remain somehow secure. We remain somehow attached to the rock, built upon the rock. We remain attached to the Christ who is our, our, our leader, our God. So this was the context. We're dealing this year, of course, with the idea of a year with God, uh, deliberately looking at what it means to seek a better version of ourselves individually and corporately as we gather and as we worship and as we live our lives. And so today I'm operating on a very specific premise, and if you'll buy into the premise, I think the rest will flow very naturally and easily, and we can get to potato bar probably sooner than not. Um, I would like to call it butter bar myself. You add potato to the butter, and then it's really good. Uh, okay, that's my my butter joke. The premise is this that I want us to, to really focus in on today. That is that if you don't value something, you won't seek it. If you don't value something, you won't, you won't treasure it. If you don't value something, you won't uh, either, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, preserve it or, or archive it or uh, uh, document it or you won't celebrate it, you won't, you won't do anything with it. It becomes just more clutter and junk in your lives. And I would like to suggest that whether we like it or not, for many of us, uh, our relationship with God falls into the category of just clutter in our lives, practically speaking. It's something we think we ought to treasure. It's something we think we ought to value. It's something we beat ourselves up with because we don't spend as much time on it maybe as we ought to. It's something we feel occasional guilt about, but it isn't necessarily something we treasure. Now, I'm not speaking to everybody. Some of you have, there's a, there's a, a love that, that surpasses everything uh, in terms of your relationship to God. And I'm, I'm not trying to make you question that. For those of you who are living that, you know you're living that. You know where your treasure is. But for a lot of people, life just goes on. We just, we get busy, things happen. I'm in this routine too. I get up in the morning, what do I have to do today? Functionally, it takes a little bit of thinking through our priorities and then scheduling ourselves accordingly, allocating our resources accordingly to demonstrate somehow that in fact we treasure something. In this case, our relationship with God. And if we're going to spend this year with God as opposed to a year apart from God or something else, it's going to be important that we have a sense of its value. So our scriptures today all in one way or another speak to this issue. You, you know the text very well, so just say it with me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Very good. See, you didn't know you had that memorized, but you did. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We usually think from a hierarchy of needs point of view. I mean, my most pressing need at the moment is to breathe. Okay, I've got to take air in, or in a very short period of time, I am no more. Taking air in keeps also my heart functioning. My heart has to keep beating. My organs have to keep. So that's the most immediate thing. My next most important need after that is going to be what? No, I can go 30 days without food probably. Water. Water is the next need that I've got on the hierarchy of those physical requirements. I'm going to need water shortly, or I'm not going to make it. I, I might have a few days or a week, maybe nine days at the out, ten tops, 
but I'm going to pass if I don't get water. Okay? Most people have about three days without water. Then, what is it after that? Potato bar, right? No. Uh, I heard sleep. I think that's probably true. We can live without sleep for extended periods of time, but we end up in lunacy. People who don't sleep go crazy. Um, psychologically, you can't manage without sleep. And so sleep becomes incredibly important in the hierarchy of needs. Food. I know some of you become cranky if you don't have food after six hours. Your blood sugar drops, you just don't feel very good, you don't operate well in life, and all of a sudden you're cranky. And I see husbands and wives looking at each other around the congregation. Oh yeah, that's you, I know. Blood sugar drops and you get cranky. It's just, you need food. So we have this sort of physical requirement for life that we live in, and we all have other needs too. We need uh, connections physically and, and socially and spiritually with one another. We need our homes, a place of shelter and retreat, safety and comfort. We need a place where we can structure all of our, our lives and our needs from. We, you know, where do you hang your clothes? Where do you sleep? How are you going to make the food? Where do you store the food from which you're going to make the food you're going to enjoy? These are all part of the needs that we have, and I know you know this, so I won't preach on this all morning. There's a certain goodness to all of this when we pursue it, don't we? Yes, no. What do you earn money for? I earn it to pay my taxes. I earn it to pay for my mortgage. I earn it to pay for my car. I earn it to pay for what I wear, where I eat, all those sorts of things. I give a huge amount of my time to work so that I might live in some sort of thing. Now, this assumes a structure. This assumes an economy. This assumes a larger society in which we have a way of doing all of these things. And so there's a sense in which that becomes really an important place of security as well. And so we tend to focus on that because once we get to places of of stability and freedom and comfort, we start to look for even more. If we can amass a little bit more, we have an even deeper sense of security and comfort. We start to trust in the things, in the structures and in the things that we've built. We don't think twice about the economy, most of us. Okay, stock market's up two points, it's down four points, it's up, it's down, it's, you know, you know I'm worth... $10 today and $9 tomorrow and 11 the next day. So what's it all What's it all matter? It just kind of does its thing, right? Gas prices are down. They'll go back up eventually. It feels good that they're down, but eventually they'll go back up over 4 bucks. It's just the way it is, right? We don't worry a lot about that. We don't think a lot about that, most of us. We just kind of move through the economy and we take it for granted. Now, our text in the Psalms today focused on that sort of larger economic picture. And there is prayer around this in the Psalm because it's an important piece. Let's just sort of take a look at this contextually really quick again, and I know it was read for us. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. They had stability in the land. They had what they needed. They could live their lives in peace. Songs could emerge. They had joy, laughter, and so forth. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. It repeats it again. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev, like those who sow with tears. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow will return with songs of joy carrying sheep with them. It's the cycle of desert, the cycle of, of the Middle East at that time, excuse me, heavily dependent on rains. They would sow their seed and hope that the rains would come that they because they were in any given time one season away from starvation. The stability that came with seasons, you know, rainy season after sowing and harvest after that, and all the goodness of the land that came to the people, this was what brought joy. And there was, you read many times in scriptures where Israel is praying an appeal to God to restore them either to their land because they've been taken from it, restore them to the land because the land has become adulterated, 
with idols and false gods, restore them to the land because they've been judged and the Philistines or some other group have taken over the land or the Amalekite raiders are coming in and taking their people and their oxen and their sheep and their harvests. There's no stability in their economic lives. There's no comfort. There's no provision and they are suffering and they appeal to God out of that. Okay, so that's a long way of saying there's a certain virtue in all this. There's a certain truth to all of this. We all seek this. We all pray for it. We all value it. It's kind of an obvious base for us from which to function. Are we clear on that? Life is not evil. It's not evil that we need to sow and harvest. It's not evil that we need to eat, breathe, do the things that we need. It's the fact of life. And we get preoccupied with it. We get busy with it. And yet God reminds us that we need to trust him on it. This is why he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else comes into place. The context for faith is not stability in life. The context for faith is that faith comes in seeking and everything else follows. Does that make sense? It does, and yet I've just turned our worlds upside down. Because functionally, again, I spend, and you do too, a lot of time trying to take care of the provision of life rather than seeking first kingdom and trusting that God adds everything else to that out of his understanding. Then we get to our passage in Ecclesiastes. This is a really, really powerful descriptor. Here is a person who has ambition and vision. This is a person who sees a plot of land and lays out a series of houses. This is a person who sees a little valley and he dams it up and makes a place where the creek that runs once a year can build into a little reservoir. And out of that, he has water for the trees that he's planted and the vineyards that he's planted. He's going to have food from all of that. This is a person who is invested in male and female slaves, and they have reproduced and multiplied and grown in his house. Now, I am not commenting on uh, the goodness of that. For us in America at this point in time, that an understanding of that is that that is an evil, that we don't traffic in human beings and profit from their labor. That wasn't the case in biblical times. There was an, a long-established social order, and the man writing in Ecclesiastes is not concerned with upsetting that, ecclesi that order. He's simply stating that he has been blessed, that his property has increased. And he speaks of that in terms of his flocks and herds as well. And the women in his house, he has male and female singers. He's actually been able to acquire a choir. Can you imagine? a full-time paid singing staff. This was what kings enjoyed. There in the palace, David playing his harp for Saul. Full-time avocation. Music to soothe the heart and the mind. And then he's got a harem. Everything a man could want, he says. Quite a picture of plenty. Quite a picture of affluence. Quite a picture of ambition brought to something. The modern equivalent would be somebody who sees opportunity and builds fortune today in our own context and in our own way. And in the midst of it all, this man can celebrate because not only does he have everything he needs physically, not only does he have luxury upon luxury for the day in which he lives, not only is every whim of his heart satisfied, but he's retained wisdom through it all. He still, as he puts it, has his perspective. And then he thinks long and hard about it. And what does he come to? Verse 10, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, for this was the reward for all my toil. 11, yet... When I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. 
a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. I like those shows on television about renovation. You've seen them, you know. I can't even think of all the titles. Renovation Addict is one of Addict is one of them. Yeah, that, that I look at that show, that's me. It's stunning to see houses that have been say not occupied for 30 years. Okay? And to see how leaks have destroyed the water has destroyed the house inside. To see how rust has corrupted everything. It's really interesting to see how beautiful flooring of hardwood that should have lasted for dozens, if not hundreds of years, is ruined and wrecked by the elements, hot and cold and vermin. It's stunning to see the economic implications of this because a beautiful brick house of good size in some neighborhoods might really be worth all fixed up on the market, $225,000 in the parts of the country they're featuring but it might take $250,000 to fix them up. And they are then worthless. But it's stunning to realize that in just 30 or 50 or 70 years, something we put enormous effort into and incredible resources into turns to garbage. I bought a house seven years ago. It was painted. Everything was fixed. Everything looked good. There were no cracks or breaks. So seven years later, my eaves are flaking. I've got spots of exposed uh, wood where if I don't fix that, it's going to rot. I've got cracks in my gr grout. In fact, some grout has actually popped out of tile. In other words, this thing, this house, this place of safety and comfort and retreat and family and all of that sort of thing is a money pit after all. You see, I will spend my life and time and energy trying to maintain that, and if somebody doesn't follow me in doing it in a very short period of time, it will be garbage. And this is where our passage in the New Testament comes in. This is where we learn something from what Christ says. In the Gospel reading, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy. You know, I've made, I'm, I, I like to be creative, and I found this beautiful silk fabric at a shop in Burbank. And I had been in Turkey, and I found this wonderful beading uh, that I got for like $25 for 40 yards. I mean, it was insanely cheap. And I took this fabric and these beadings and some other things, and I took them to a tailor, uh, a wonderful Korean lady in my neighborhood who sews beautifully, and I had her make drapes for me because I'd seen this fabric used outdoors. So I had all of these shiny, silky curtains outdoors that gave shade and protection to my front door, which hits the sun really bad in the summer, and my back patio so that I could be in some comfort during the, the heat of summer and so forth. Well, this was now three years ago that these were, were put out. I noticed the other day that some of the curtains had tears in them, where the sun had faded the fabric and where the silk had deteriorated to the point that the fabric no longer stayed together. My investment of time and creativity and energy and effort in a very short period of time turned to junk. Junk. I spent time, energy, and money, and it turned to junk. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The stock market that is 18,000 today can be 13,000 tomorrow. Where is your treasure? The home you put $700,000 in today can be reduced to ash tomorrow. Where do you put your treasure? The job that you've invested so much energy in building relationships in and connections in and expertise in can be outsourced or downsized tomorrow. 
Where's your treasure? No one can serve two masters, Jesus says. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Sounds like two ways of saying the same thing to me. You cannot serve both God and money. That seems harsh. But let's look at what he's talking about. Going back up earlier, where is your treasure? What is it that you put your value in? What is most important to you in life? Where do your energies go? What is it that you are doing? Because if you're seeking to build for yourself a fortune like the man in Ecclesiastes, at some point you're going to wake up and say, it's meaninglessness. There's nothing there. It's fleeting. That which I've built will not endure. In Matthew 13, Jesus describes in a parable a pearl of great price. Now, it's hard for us to imagine this in an era of cultured pearls and an era in which, you know, the sort of quintessential businesswoman's attire includes a pearl necklace. It's in this era very difficult for us to conceive of a pearl of great price. But if you go back to a time when pearls weren't cultivated and when they were natural and when people didn't have scuba gear and when finding a pearl might be an accident of fortune, to find one that was beautifully formed and of great symmetry and luster would be as rare as finding a pink diamond today. The pearl of great price is this incredible rarity of beauty. And one who deals in business, one who understands the value of these things in commerce, finds one one day. He sees it. He recognizes it for what it is. This is the pearl of great price. And Jesus says he goes and sells everything he has and buys it. There is a seeking in Scripture for a treasure that is always akin to the kingdom. It's always connected to the idea of kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom. The kingdom is like a woman who lost a dowry coin. And she looked through her entire house and swept the dirt until she found it. And when she found it, she called all of her friends together and said, Rejoice with me, for I have found that which was lost. The kingdom of God is precious. And the reason it's precious is because it cannot be subject to rust or water rot or mold or moth or decay. It cannot be stolen, cannot be robbed, it cannot be taken. It can only be received. The kingdom of God surpasses the comforts that we seek physically, the assurances that we seek, the security we seek financially. The kingdom of God trumps all of that. And at the center of the kingdom of God, we don't find an abstraction. The idea isn't something obtuse, out there, something that we can't, what's the word I'm looking for? Obscure is the word I was looking for. Something we can't we can't grab a hold of. Ethereal, thank you, beautiful word. The kingdom of God is what is most real. A few weeks ago, or maybe even last week, I mentioned a favorite text of mine that God is the ground of being. In him we live and move and have our being. Our very existence is set upon the creative principle in the person of God. And if our very existence is anchored there, the one who creates is the one who's redeemed. That's where we live. And the one who redeemed has promised to recreate and make all things new. That's where we live. The ground of our being isn't my address in Glendale or your address here in Santa Clarita. The ground of our being isn't even who we're married to or what our families are. It is superseded 
It's transcended by our relationship to the one who made us, the one who redeems us, and the one who calls us to eternity. This is the foundation. And until we see that for what it is, the pearl of great price, until we understand that Jesus is that pearl, until we understand that a relationship with God is the greatest treasure we might ever seek or find, we're going to be creating something that will ultimately be meaningless. Even this church we've built many years back and renovated a couple times since and that we continue to invest in week after week is subject to rot and termite and decay. It's subject to the elements. Even this house of God is not eternal. The New Testament reading in Corinthians points out the depth that we seek. I'm going to start in verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And then Paul speaks to the reality that he and his friends are engaged in. We preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said this, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus Christ. And here's the context. We have this treasure in jars of clay. What does Paul mean by that? What is a jar of clay? It's a vessel, isn't it? And in the scripture, this jar of clay, this vessel, this, this is used many times. What is Adam formed of? Clay. There's the image in scripture of the potter and the pot and being molded and made. There's the image of the broken pot and the pot sherds and the pot that's made anew. And we have this vessel in jars of clay, this, this, this treasure in jars of clay. It's a plain wrapping that it comes in. It's a human fleshly wrapping. But we have this treasure of God in Christ to show us to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And here, a bridge back to last week. We're hard-pressed on every side but not crushed. Perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. And the reason for this is what we talked about last week. We're grounded in something deeper, something more real, something more meaningful, something more powerful, and more eternal. We're grounded in God, in the person of Christ. So here's what it all comes down to. What do you value? Now, I'm going I'm to point you a couple of directions. When we as a church make a budget, all we're doing is allocating money according to our values. When you make a budget at home, all you're doing is allocating your resources according to your values. What do you value? Where do your resources go? Where do you put your time, your energy, your love? Does that show in any way what it is that you've come to see? 
what it is you've come to treasure, what it is you've come to value. Do you remember the pearl of great price? Upon seeing it, the man goes and sells everything he has to raise the capital and comes back and buys it. Why? Because he's a brilliant businessman. And he knows that the pearl of great price cannot be beat. He knows that as in terms of an investment, there's nothing greater he could invest his time, his energy, his resource, his life in. And everything goes to that. It's a good thing that we have an economy that works. It's a good thing we can participate for the most part in it. It's a good thing that we have homes and a degree, a modicum of security. It's a good thing that we have food and a place to make it, that we have a place to extend our relations, live our lives. We're very fortunate people. But we forget that that's not what it's all about. What it's all about is something deeper, something greater, something worth treasuring. The one who made us, the one who loved, who loved us from the foundation of the world, the one who redeemed us and made himself one of us, the one who promises to come again the one who is the resurrection and the life, and the one who makes all things new, the one who is the king of the kingdom of God, and the one who is the source of all righteousness. If in this year of living with God, you can make this your treasure, it will be an amazing year for you. If in this year of living with God, this can be your focus and your passion and your investment point and your attention, we will easily find that we come to a better version of ourselves. And we will easily find that we come to a better version of ourselves corporately. If you could embrace this pearl as your treasure, this year next time, there won't be an empty pew. Life is consuming. But at the end of life, don't you want to look back and say you pursued the better version of yourself? At the end of your life, I mean, I'll just give you a quick example. I'm in school, many of you know. Why am I doing this, especially at my age? I'm doing this because it's the better version of myself. I don't want to get to 70 and say, you know, I've got a PhD in television watching. I'm so glad I watched Rehab Addict 300 times. I'm so glad I spent 77 million hours watching reruns of Friends. I'm not opposed to a little entertainment. I think there's value in it. I think downtime is important, even for somebody who's busy. But hear me. When I say, for me, you'll have to work it out for you. I don't want to get to 90 and look back on my life and say I wasted my time. And pursuing what I'm pursuing in school is part of that. It's not wasting my time. It's expanding my mental horizons, my view of who God is in the world, and what it is that I might achieve in the time that he's given me. I don't say that to brag. I don't say that because I expect you to follow me. I say that because it's just a little sliver of something that illustrates for me what it means to be pursuing a better version of me. It's a way of seeking for myself the kingdom in a new light, in a new way, in an expanded reality. What's your version? How is it that you want to move through life? What is it that you want said of you? What's going to be important when it's all said and done? And I'm just telling you today, it's plain in Scripture, and it's true to experience. If you will seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, 
everything else will come. Everything else will come. What do you treasure? O oh Lord, be our vision and help us to see, to really see, that you are that treasure. And not just to see, but to seek. That in seeking we might find, and in finding we might live life now, more abundantly, and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.